have this turned on. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a different day. It's a different uh, day than we have had before, and it's a completely different day than we might have expected a week ago. Uh, but I want us to be comfortable and to fully understand one thing, that God is in control. No matter what concerns or chaos or unknowns that we have in the world right now, which are plenty, um, he's in charge and he will not fail us. Uh, we're in a time we've never been in. Uh, it reminds Marcia and I and some people that we were speaking with the other day of the polio scare in the uh, mid-50s. Uh, I'm sure other people are reminded probably of the beginning of World War II with uh, rationing and uh, uh, different uh, things that were events that were curtailed and, and stopped. Uh, I've seen another uh, comparison made uh, to the uh, Spanish flu of 1918, uh, which was uh, the time when the borders of this uh, country were closed uh, to try and contain that. Uh, regardless, uh, we're here, and you are where you are. Uh, you may have the opportunity to have a cup of coffee that you may not normally have during, uh, uh, during service. Uh, and we're blessed, and we're exactly where God wants us to be. Um, and the great thing that I actually am seeing uh, coming out of all of this is that people are caring for each other. And that's wonderful. And that's what it's all about. Uh, life of the church has been curtailed, obviously. But that doesn't mean it's been stopped and it's not going to be stopped. These things are not going to stop God's work. Uh, so we are still going to have third Thursday uh, meal this, uh, this Thursday. It will be takeouts only. Uh, I spoke with Sammy this morning, um, and uh, we'll need approximately 10 people. Uh, and so if you can, uh, we would love for you to, uh, to be here because we are going to uh, have cars circle around the church uh, and come underneath the drive through uh, Their orders will be taken. We will put the uh, takeouts in their cars. Uh, and we will, will, with love, send them off on their way. So we'll need runners, uh, we'll need people to direct traffic, and we'll need people to fill the takeouts. So uh, if you can help, and I know of a few already, I know of at least three that have told me that you can. So Marie and, and, and Cresta and Mackenzie, you guys are good. Uh, and so I have at least three more. Uh, so we'll need another four. Uh, and that would be great. And if you can let, if you can text Marsha or call her and let her know, uh, then we'll know when we're filled up on that. But uh, so, so we do need about 10 people for that, and we really do appreciate that. Um, the other things that you can see, we didn't know when we put the, when we made this slide, uh, what's going to go on with Catawba Elementary School. But we now know that all of the uh, uh, that all of the um, uh, schools are closed for the next couple of weeks, and um, with that, uh, backpacks, will, backpacks will be curtailed for a while, but I will tell you, that's going to make a huge impact on our blessing box. Our blessing box, which already, as you well know, we've been going through more than 100 items a week, will now be going through, I mean, 100 items a day, will now be going through more items than that. So, uh, if you'll think in terms of, Mary and I talked about this yesterday, if you'll think in terms of canned meals, dry cereal, uh, shelf milk, that's boxed milk that can stay on a shelf, um, snacks for kids that are contained, uh, th so that, uh, and drinks, and especially juices, boxed juices, things like that uh, for kids, uh, we're going to really start to move uh, focus to, in the box towards kids over these next two weeks uh, with them being out of school. So if you can do that and just, uh, if you have a key, great, put it in the fellowship hall. If you don't have a key, uh, leave it on the breezeway, on the bench in the breezeway. Somebody will be here often. If you live close by and you can help stock the box, please check with Mary Young uh, and, and she will... Um, 
coordinate that with you. She and Bill do a great job. Kevin helps uh, only when there's a pinch needed out there, but, uh, uh, but they do a great job with that right now, but the box probably now will be stocked logically. That means that the box is never gonna get jammed because that's not the right way to do it, but the box will probably be stocked logically at least three to four times a day over these next couple of weeks to help these families um, uh, that need things. And uh, I think that's everything. Elizabeth, am I missing anything that you can think of? So now let's relax and allow Elizabeth to take us into a time of worship. Amen. I do love to listen to her play. And it's even more fun sometimes when we're sitting in an empty church and I get to hear um, completely. And it's, uh, uh, it's just lovely because you know that the spirit goes right through her fingers as she plays. Uh, the theme that I, I've laid out for today as I continue to think about this day, uh, the theme is it's confusing. And it is confusing, uh, whether we're talking about the world we're in today or whether we're talking about 2,000 years ago uh, when Jesus was here, and especially um, this scenario that we're going through. Last week, we heard the third chapter of John, the Gospel of John, and we heard about the confusing conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus left that evening um, frustrated. Now, he eventually got it, but it took him two and a half years to get it and, it, and it was over a time period. And we're going to talk about the sequence of events that happened in John's mind right after that meeting um, with Nicodemus, but I do need to take you through some uh, history of Israel and um, history of the Jewish nation. Uh, in the time of David, well, actually in the time of Moses, you then had Joshua who led everyone across the Jordan River, and you ended up with people taking the promised land and moving into the promised land. And we hear about the 12 tribes of Israel, and we knew all about that. And they existed that way for the next almost 450 years. And David became, Saul was the first king, but David became the first unification king in the year 1000 where everyone got tremendously excited 
to have their king. And then his son Solomon was the next king, and people were still excited and even more excited to the fact that the temple was built in Jerusalem during the time of Solomon. So now you not only had this wonderful nation, but you had the place of gathering, the temple, the place of worship, the place where they believe God dwelt. Well, the people in the north started to become dissatisfied after Solomon died. And they said, we don't like this. The people in the south, they've got that temple, the king lives down there, the king comes up here periodically. We're not real happy about this. So ultimately, 10 of the 12 tribes, all the tribes except the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, which occupied the area that we call now Judea, they all left and started their own nation, which they called Israel. And that was up north. And Aaron, I think you've got a map. Okay, so this is the map uh, that you'll see in the time of uh, Jesus. So what happened was the two tribes in the south, this, this Judea area, they really just had, Beth, they had Bethlehem and they had Jerusalem. All this other area, all of this area, was the other ten tribes. And they called themselves Israel. Now, the reason that you ended up with such an intense dislike for the Jews to the Sumerians was because it was a natural outgrowth of the division between the Israel and Judea. But in 722, the Assyrians overran this northern section. And they took 43,000 able-bodied men and they took them up here and displaced them to Syria and they replaced them with people from at least five other nations sort of over here and put them in this area right here. What you ended up with were lots of religions, lots of mixed marriages, and what the Jewish people considered to be unclean population. That's why they considered the Samaritans to be dogs, to be lower than the lowest. So now you fast forward to the time of Jesus, and there has been a lot of reparation between Judea, Perea, Decapolis, Galilee, all of this has been pulled back together, but not Samaria. Samaria was still considered to be where the dogs lived, the lowest of the low. And we need to know that going in to today's teaching, because we're going to hear about the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman today. And it becomes an amazing story. So I just wanted to put a, a piece of, of background, a piece of history out there before we go any further. So, Aaron, if you'll go to the next slide. So we'll see in this scripture where, now coming out of the third chapter of John, and this is one of the few times that we do think that this stayed in chronological order, so coming out of this third chapter, after Jesus had left Nicodemus, then he left the Judea area and he went to the, to the Jordan River Valley and he had done some baptizing. So now John, John puts this into a more condensed form. So this is the fourth chapter of John, verses 3 through 7. So he, that would be Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he's going up the Jordan River Valley. Now he had to go through Samaria. Aaron, I'm going to ask you to go back to the slide for just a second. Just go back 
So you can look at the, the uh, river going up right there, okay? That's where he was going to, um, to do his baptizing. And he said, technically, he does have to go through Samaria if he stays on the west side of the Jordan River. But I'll explain this further when we get there. So now, Aaron, if you'll go back and we'll finish the scripture. Um, so he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Shechem, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw uh, water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, so he's gone to the well. He speaks to a woman. He speaks to a Samaritan woman. This is fascinating. We'll hear that the disciples went on and they moved on. No Jew goes to Samaria and stays. No Jewish man speaks to a Samaritan woman and let alone asks her for a drink of water. Yeah. 
Amen. Thank you. Let's share. Let's share what we uh, believe. I believe believe in God God, the the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker maker of of heaven heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we left him. We left him and her. There he was speaking to a Samaritan woman. And there she is. Up there. Now, I need to do a better job of explaining the differences here. So, Jesus had left this area down here. And he was going back up here, the area of Galilee up here. But they had come down to the Jordan River and they were actually baptizing some people. His disciples were baptizing some people right in this area. And John the baptizer was still alive at this point. This is right at the end of the third chapter of John. And John the, baptize, John the baptizer's disciples say to John the baptizer, he's deci- uh, baptizing more people than we are. Uh, and John the, baptizer, John the baptizer said yes, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but So John the baptizer was not upset about that at all. But then Jesus says, okay, we're going to go, and he goes, instead of going up here to Galilee, he goes here, all right? This area right here is below sea level, somewhere around uh, six, 700 feet below sea level. This area right here, which is about 20 miles away, is somewhere around 2,000 feet above sea level. They're walking Okay, they're walking from here to here. It's all up. I can't tell you how barren this countryside is. It's virtually yellow. That's its color. Uh, It's that barren. But Jacob's well is here. And this is the famous, famous, famous Jacob's well. And its water never runs dry. That well is there today. You can get water out of that well. We've gotten water out of that well. We've drunk it. It's cool. It's wonderful. It is a deep well. But this is where Jesus has gone. And no good Jew, even if they travel from Jerusalem down here through Samaria this way to go up, they never stop. They never spend the night. They might stop to get a drink of water. They never spend the night. And they don't talk to people, and they especially don't talk to women. But this is not where Jesus came from. Jesus came from here and had to purposely walk up. So he made a conscious decision to go there. And I just think it's important that we understand that. So we're going to continue this discussion between Jesus and the woman. Now I said last week that um, the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus was the longest one-on-one discussion that I am aware of that we can find in the Bible between Jesus and a man. But I did not say it's the longest one-on-one discussion that he's had because his discussion with this woman is to me, far and away, the longest one-on-one discussion that you can find between Jesus and and anyone in the Bible, and it becomes a fascinating discussion. Aaron, if we'll go to the scripture. In parentheses, it says, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, the conversation starts, the Samaritan woman said to him, 
You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Back to parentheses. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you great? And this is the woman still speaking. Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. So here's my thought. There's a lot that went on there. And she challenges them. She challenges him with two, what I think are hard, slightly innocuous statements and questions. She asked him straight out, are you greater than our father Jacob? Because for her whole life, she has been taught that Jacob was the greatest of all. So she asked that question straight out. But then, the hardest one. You Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Is she right? Is he upset? Interesting thoughts.
Amen. And I love that. And, and I love what Elizabeth has done to emphasize the thoughts and questions uh, that we have in this teaching today. Contrasting today to last week, we had Nicodemus, a man who was powerful, a man who was educated, a man who was wealthy, a man who had position, who had a meeting that he had asked for with Jesus. And he became dumbfounded when Jesus told him, you must be reborn again. Because he said, how do we believe? And Jesus said, you must be reborn again. And Nicodemus was stymied with that, this very, very educated man. Today we have a woman who had no idea Jesus was coming. Clearly Jesus knew she was coming. She does not have power. She does not have position. She does not have a husband. In fact, she comes from somewhat questionable background. She does not seem to be overly educated. And he engages in this amazing discussion with her, and she asks him a very honest, heartfelt question. Are you greater than Jacob? And you can see that. that. And you can see her justification in asking that question. Then she makes a combination of a question and a statement saying, you're a prophet, but I don't understand this piece that you say that you Jews must go to Jerusalem to worship. That that's where your God is, is in Jerusalem. So as we continue on in this story, and and I love this picture that you found, because A, that's exactly what it looked like. And today there's a church built over that well, but the area around it is very much like that. And the well's still there, and it is deep, as she says. It takes a while to get down to the water. But these next five verses that John puts together are really powerful. So I'll remind us the two thoughts that I had when we left. Was she wrong? And was he upset? Aaron, if you'll take us to the scripture. So continuing on, verses 21 through 26. Jesus responds to her, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. I'm going to stop there for a second. The group in the north, when they split from the Judeans, built their own temples. First they built a temple in Shikar. Then they built a temple in Samaria. So, and where they are is in the valley, right in between there. But they believed you had to go to one of their temples to worship God, just as the Jews in the south believed you had to go to their temple to worship God. So that's where Jesus is is referring to as he responds here. So I'll just repeat, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We, he's speaking now of his followers, worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming And has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in the truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming the one called Christ. When he comes, 
He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The word of God for the people of God. This is an amazing story. He reveals himself to an uneducated woman from Samaria of questionable background. And you have to ask yourself, why? She didn't have the barriers that the Nicodemuses or the Jews who were so steeped in their laws had. And you can see and you can feel the connection growing between the two of them. She's not fearful of him. She's not intimidated by him. But she has become very respectful of him. She's not in awe, but she's starting to become in love. And, and you can absolutely feel that. And I love the way he says who he is. And I love the way he says that we, all of us who believe, will worship God in the Spirit. And you can add a phrase to that. Where we are. Because where we are is where he is, no matter how confusing things might be. But his declaration. I, the one speaking to you, I am he. What a beautiful call and beckoning he has made to her. Sometimes the way is lonely and deep and filled with pain. And if the sky is dark and force the rain, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus. Music fills the night. 
Amen. You know, I hate the fact that we don't have people here, but boy, am I blessed that you're here. It, uh, it's neat to be able to listen to you. Um, in my brain, he says to her, he reveals to her that the Messiah is here. I just feel like she got it that she wasn't dumbfounded, that she got it right there. And indeed, the Messiah is here. And now is the time that we will lift our prayers. And we, we know of some that have come up during the week. Uh, Elizabeth has put uh, on the Facebook page that if anyone has prayer, prayer requests, uh, to, to text them in. And do that during the week for next week because we'll be doing service exactly the same way. Uh, next week also. Uh, But we do have prayer requests that we know that have come up during the week, and we have some from last week. So let's go to the Lord now in the time of prayer. Yes, Lord, indeed, we are your children. Here in your house where Elizabeth and I and Aaron are, and in the homes where you have us, so many different places, we lift to you our thoughts and our prayers. We lift to you Doris Brown, whom you love and whom you know dearly. And you know everything that Doris is facing and you know the decisions that you will be making. Lord, we just ask that you wrap your arms around her. We lift to you B. Del Piano, who is uh, uh, in the hospital, in um, Baptist Hospital in uh, Wake Forest right now, uh, where, uh, excuse me, um, she's in Baptist Hospital right now, where she's had a full stroke. Um, She is somewhat stabilized, but is still on a lot of support systems. She was, uh, as I, when I saw her on Wednesday, which was the last time I was able to see her, she was very responsive in speaking to Brian uh, last night. She is still responsive. She can't speak because she has breathing tubes in her, uh, but we just ask that you continue to hold her up in prayer with Brian, um, with, uh, uh, with Aunt Marie, uh, also Aunt Patty, uh, um, 
at the same time. We lift to you Nell, uh, who is in uh, one nursing home that is now uh, in a lockdown scenario. We lift to you Willie, who's in a different nursing home that's in a lockdown scenario. We lift to you Ringo, uh, as he is going through job discernment, and uh, we just ask, Lord, that you remove the barriers and you open uh, that up. We open the, uh, we lift to you the family of Lise and family and friends of Lise Brown, Jill's very dear friend, um, and we ask for travel mercies. Uh, Lise says, uh, come to live in your house now, Lord, but we ask for travel mercies for Jill and others uh, as they travel to Louisiana for the celebration uh, of her life. We lift to you Bill uh, and his mother and the whole family uh, as they go through continued uh, uh, care uh, requirements uh, for Bill's mom. Uh, and all of those care requirements are surrounded with love, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, we lift to you Paul and Augustina uh, on the loss of, the, of, of their baby girl. Uh, we lift to you Caroline um, and Randy uh, as they have returned from Europe, and uh, we are happy that they're home, but they will go through uh, uh, two weeks of quarantine. We lift to you Jess and, uh, Jeff and Sue. Uh, and the tragedy of the family loss uh, that has gone on there. Uh, we lift to you our world. We lift to you our country. We lift to you all those impacted by this virus. We ask, Lord, that you allow this terrible situation to create the opportunity for us to spend more time with you and for individuals to spend more time with you, for individuals to understand that if they can, reaching out with helping hands. This is a fantastic opportunity. Jesus did this so magnificently. He went to people continually, and he always was able to show us a better way, the next step. He gave us so many gifts, and we're so appreciative, God, for all the gifts that Jesus gave to us. But the gift, as I've said many times, that I believe he gave to us, it's the most important, is the gift to, to be able to communicate with you at any time, the gift of prayer. I love the fact that the one morning when he was returning from praying, one of the disciples, and we believe it was this gospel writer, John, was the disciple who saw him coming back and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And although Jesus had said to them at the very beginning of his ministry, on the Mount of Beatitudes and how to pray. Here he repeats two years later exactly the same thing to this disciple. He said, when you pray, pray simply by saying this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and deliver us this day, excuse me, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we'll come back to the story because there's more to this story. So now Jesus and the Samaritan woman, who's unnamed, have had this amazing discussion. And now things start to come back to sort of, quote, normal. We're going to continue on in John, fourth chapter. We're going to start with verse 27. We're going to go through verse 34. So after they've just had this exchange where Jesus says to him, the one you are speaking of, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? And we're going to have two parallel conversations here. And I'm sorry, I should have said that in the beginning. So Aaron, I'm going to ask you to go back to that. You're going to hear two parallel conversations in this set of, um, of scriptures. You're going to hear Jesus speaking with his disciples and then her speaking with people in town. 
So let me start again. Just then, Jesus returned, and we're surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jug, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now we'll go back to Jesus speaking to the disciples at the well. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Two amazing conversations. Let me take the woman's conversation first. She left the water at the well. Was probably one of the significant jobs that she had. There was no running water through this town. This town was very high up, is very high up in the mountains. The source of water is the well. So everything that they need to do with water requires it coming from the well. She leaves the water at the well goes into town and speaks to men. Now, I understand they're not Jews, but she is not to speak to men, just openly speak to men, let alone to make some declaration that I may have just seen the Messiah. So that's a startling conversation over here. Now you have the conversation with Jesus and the disciples. They come back from town. They saw him speaking to a woman, to a Samaritan woman. They don't ask the obvious questions at all. Why were you speaking to a woman? What did you say to her? They don't ask any of that. They go right into, um, what would you like to eat? And Jesus says, to them and answers them in one of his normal, amazing ways. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And they don't realize that this is actually a put down to them. And the disciples, of course, take it literally and say, somebody else bring him food? Who could that have been? The woman was just getting water. But I love what Jesus wants his food to be. To do the will of of he who sent me and to finish his work. That thought just hit me this morning as I was looking at that. And is the situation we're in right now so that we can have more food? This food that Jesus is talking about? This food about doing the will of he who sent me? To finish the work that he started? I love the thought. What's our food? right here and it's an unending supply it's right there how do we how do we eat it how do we fulfill it with our hands and with our feet and i don't care whether it's putting food in that box to take care of the people that we know are going to need food quickly or whether it is serving as many people as we possibly can on Third Thursday and getting the word out to people that if they need food, especially this Thursday, if they need a meal, come. We have prepared the meal for them and, and, and to come for that. But is it also a phone call to somebody or a card 
to Randy and Caroline, who are going to be isolated for the rest of the next two weeks? Is it just, is it checking on your neighbors, especially your neighbors who have kids who are now going to be home from school? Is it seeing if you can help them somehow? Do you have a single parent? Do you have a friend who's a single parent? Who's the head of their household? Because I'm telling you right now, they're, they are really strapped. They're trying to figure out how to take care of their kids. They're trying to figure out how to get to work. This is really a challenge for them. Can you help them out? Can that be our food? I think it's just such a tremendous time. And here we are in this time of need. And there's one thing that is always constant in times of need of what we truly do need. Amen. Thank you. And we do need the Lord. There's no two ways about it. Let's hear the end of this story, this amazing, amazing story. So now we're going to go to the last four verses. 
verses 39 through 42 in the fourth chapter of John. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the word, of the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This amazing story, this woman may have been the first apostle, the first one to carry the word and to convert others to the word. We've been reading about the Acts of the Apostles for the last months now, and we saw how Paul had carried the word with great courage, but this woman carried the word also with great courage, years before Paul ever did, to a group of people lower than dogs. And they came to him, and they believed, because she carried living water and she carried it knowing that it was living water. We have that ability. You have that ability through your fingers and through your voice, through your heart. You do it all the time. And it's amazing. You just did it with your mother and going down there. But each and every one of us has that same ability through the gifts that God has given us. This woman found a gift to go and speak to the men and spoke with belief and conviction. We may not all have that gift, but we all have gifts that we are to carry knowing that our gifts are our living water. And we are to carry our gifts to those that we see. So I'll remind us, check on each other, take care of each other, check on our neighbors. Send a note to Doris. Send a note to Willie. Send a note to Nell and to anyone else who may be shut in. Especially, check on single parents. If you have a friend who's a single parent with kids in school, Check on them. See if you can help them. But be willing to carry the living water, to carry the light that John tells us right in the beginning of his gospel. The word became light. So be willing to carry the light.
So the, the word, the message, it may be confusing. But when we boil it down, it does come back to the same place. He asks us no matter what, no matter whether we're Nicodemus with education and power and wealth, or whether we're the woman at the well with no education, a lowly position. He asks us to do exactly the same thing. To be his hands, to be his feet, to carry the living water, to carry the light. Everywhere we go, and especially now in this time of confusion, in this time of darkness for others, if we can bring, be the light coming into their worlds, that's exactly what he wants. So as we prepare to leave this place and as you prepare to enter the world, do so knowing that you go everywhere covered with the grace of God, filled with the love of Jesus, constantly carrying the mercy of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go now. Go into this world when it needs you the most and go fully armed and equipped and carry the living water. The time has come for the church to leave this building and to leave the buildings where you are. Go now, go now in peace. Amen. Amen, and God bless you all.